Hello, everyone. Okay, shall we carry on? Are you ready? So let's just uh, quickly have a look at the ah reinforcements. Yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> it's a nice color for the coffee thing, you know. Black is just right. Yeah, yeah I like that. <laughs> so let's uh, carry on. So we're going to have a look at the result of the practice, right? Uh, so you have like the right view at the beginning, then you have all the practice going on, and then we have the result. That's what we're looking at now. I'm going to look at this fairly quickly because it's not really the main thing I want to focus on. It's just part of the suttas. I thought I might as well go through it quickly. Yeah. So again, I, I just read this before, the, the sage. Yeah, This is here, the Muni. You can see the world over here for sage. One of the important words for Muni, for sage. Uh, another one is um, uh, is Rishi or Isi, it also means sage. There's a number of words for sage in the suttas. So, it never strays from the truth. The Brahman stands firm on the shore. The word Brahman here is like the, uh, the god, right? In, in the uh, Hindu religion or the Brahmanical religion, Brahman is the supreme god of the, uh, the Hindus. It's like the uh, you know, underlying kind of reality of existence. In Buddhism, that word is used to mean the highest. Yeah, it means like the person who is an arahant, who is fully awakened. They are called the Brahman. So the Buddha takes the words of ancient India, of the Brahmanical tradition, and he uses them in new ways to have, uh, give them new meanings. So Brahman, instead of just being either a... Actually, no, here it doesn't mean that. Here it means Brahmana. Here it means the, the people of the highest caste, the priestly caste. So the, the Buddha redefines, instead of being a priestly caste, and therefore you are the highest, the Buddha says you are the highest because you are an arahant. So he calls the arahants brahmanas to make them the highest. So he redefines these terms. Having given up everything, they are said to be at peace. Yeah, so to really be at peace, you have to give up everything. This is what you do as an as a, uh, arahant. Giving up, what does it mean to give up? Give up does not mean you reject everything. Giving up just means that you give up attachment and craving for everything. That is the idea of giving up here. All craving, all attachment is gone. Yeah, even to your own life, even to your own five khandas, even to your own mind, you have no attachment. Then you are santo, you are at peace. You see the word santo down there at the very bottom. One of these beautiful words that is used in the suttas. The santo muni, you see santo there, you see muni there. It is sometimes it is uh, combined. Santo Muni means the sage at peace. We have an, an agaric at our monastery who calls himself Santo Muni. I don't know if he's all that peaceful, but anyway, that's what he calls himself. <laughs> they have truly known they are a knowledge master, understanding the teaching, they are independent. They rightly proceed in the world, uh, not coveting anything here. Yeah, you have truly known, you have a true insight, uh, and that is the meaning of knowledge master in, in the uh, Buddhist teachings. Uh, the word Vedagu is also used in the Brahmanical tradition, yeah, the Hindu tradition, but there it means you know the Vedas. Uh, in other words, you have, a, you have memorized the Vedas. Uh, but in Buddhism, we give it a new meaning. Once again, in the Buddhism, it means that you have insight. Uh, so the difference between the Buddhism and the Brahm Brahmanical tradition is that in the Brahmanical tradition, knowledge is related to having memorized things, yeah? knowledge like school knowledge. In Buddhism, real knowledge has to do with insight. And of course, that is much more profound. Understanding the teaching, they are independent. Yeah? The idea that uh, a true master in Buddhism is an independent person is a very important point. Uh, and this is one of the ways you can recognize someone who is very profound and who has very deep meditation and insight. Are they independent or not? Are they able to live the world free of the worries about what other people think? Yeah, Independence is one of the beautiful results of this practice. If you want to be more independent in your life, and I think we all like to be more independent, one way of doing that is actually to practice the Buddhist path. It makes you more independent. It makes you more your own person. 
being able to stand your own ground, not being so concerned about what the people think about you. It's a beautiful result of the path. They rightly proceed in the world, right? They live well in the world. They live in the right way here. Not coveting anything here, not being desirous of anything. You move through the world without leaving a trace because you don't covet anything here. You don't desire anything in the world. You don't bother anyone. There's no arguments to be had with you because there's nothing that you want from the world anymore, huh? except for coffee. Huh? <coughs> no. <laughs> One who has crossed over sensuality here, uh, the snare in the world so hard to get past, uh, grieves not nor hopes. Uh, they have cut the strings, uh, they are no longer bound. Uh, you, have, you can see how this idea of sensuality or the, sens the sensory world always comes back, uh, and it always comes back as something that is very difficult to deal with, very difficult to overcome. Uh, yeah, and this is, I think, one of the things in the sutta that is one of the recurring themes, as, as so to speak, in the sutta, is that the sensory world is something that we really need to work on, on the Buddhist practice. Uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't overstate it. For monastics, probably more important. Uh, but the idea is that if you really want to let go of the lower world and reach something higher, giving up the sensory world is actually a very important part. And it's a very difficult thing to do. Huh? Because it is so attractive, it is so ensnaring, uh, and it's not easy to give it up. Uh, but to re get a really peaceful mind, uh, a mind that turns away and turns towards real peace, it is actually going to be a requirement down the path. Uh. So this is why it is so emphasized in the suttas. Once you leave sensuali sensuality behind, the rest of the path is fairly easy. That is by far the hardest part, part of the path. Uh. Yeah, the snare in the world is so hard to get past. Uh. Yeah, the snare, it ties you up, uh, makes it really difficult. Uh, once you are past that, you have no grief about what's happened, nor do you have any hopes for the future, because you've given up those things entirely. No strings, uh, and you, have, you are no longer bound. What came before, let wither away, and after, let there be nothing. Uh, if you don't grasp at the middle, you will live at peace. Uh, Yeah, so what came before? You are never worried about it. You never live in the past. Uh, yeah, it's all gone. You just let it wither away and disappear. Uh, sometimes people live in the past in this world. Uh, but if you are on the spiritual path, there's no need to live in the past because you are moving towards more light, more brightness. You're moving towards a better life. That makes it much easier to let go of the past. Uh, and after, let there be nothing. You have nothing, no interest in the future, huh? because you're living here and now, doing the best you can possibly do. Huh? And that is what matters in your life. Huh? You don't grasp at the middle, you don't grasp at what is here, right now, either. Huh? You just go with the flow of things. Yeah? You float through the world in an easy way, not grasping at the past, the future or the present. Huh? And then you will live at peace. Huh? Upasanto, upasamo, another of these beautiful words is that uh, uh, basically means uh, peace and uh, stillness in your life. Uh, no grasping at anything. Uh. This particular verse is very similar to what you find in the Badde Karatta Sutta, famous sutta in the Majjhimanika 131, one auspicious night, uh, and it has the same kind of idea. You live or you dwell or you meditate without... Uh, holding on to the past without grasping on to the future uh, and you have insight into the present states as they are here. Uh. And this is how you kind of have an auspicious night of meditation if you like. Uh. One who has no sense of ownership uh, in the whole realm of name and form uh, does not grieve for that which is not. Uh, they suffer no loss in the world. Uh. Yeah. Mama yitang, nothing. You have no mine. Mama means my. So you have no mine. In other words, no ownership. Yeah? This, is, this is mine. Give it to me. You have none of that mine thing. Yeah? And because you have none of that mine thing in the whole realm of name and form. Well, name and form here, nama rupa, this is everything in our mind and body. Yeah? This is everything that we can relate to mentally or physically. That's the realm of name and form. So you don't 
grasp anything anywhere yeah, in the whole world, including your inner world and the inner things that you normally people are very uh, concerned about. Uh, all of that, it becomes irrelevant for you. Uh, and because you grasp nothing in any of these realms, uh, there's nothing to grieve. Uh, yeah, because you can never suffer loss in the world. Uh, whatever happens in your life, uh, loss becomes impossible because no, you don't take anything to be yours. Uh, so even if you die, even if you lose your own life, you haven't lost anything because it wasn't your life anyway. And you kind of just shrug your shoulders, okay, should I kill you? Whatever, it's up to you. Yeah, I don't really care. Yeah, do as you see fit. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. Yeah. If you don't think of anything as belonging to yourself or others, not finding anything to be mine, you won't grieve thinking, I don't have it. Yeah, it's more of the same, really. If nothing belongs to you or anyone, nothing is yours, well, you can't think, I don't have it. Yeah, You don't think of things as belonging to you anymore, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, You just kind of move on, you allow things to be. Things belong to nature, things belong to the world, they belong to impermanence. They're not really the possessions of anyone. It's this idea of uh, borrowing things. Things are borrowed goods. Uh, nothing to hold on to, uh, nothing to grasp in the whole world. Uh, it's hard to understand. Yeah? This is kind of the arahant, remember. Uh, and it's just meant there for inspiration, not really for full comprehension. Because as long as you have a sense of self, actually it is impossible to understand this fully. Uh. Not bitter, not fawning, unstirred, everywhere even. When asked about one who is unshakable, I declare that that is the benefit. Not bitter, not fawning. Um, okay, not fawning, not greedy or something, not, not really holding on to things. Unstirred, this is like the idea of being imperturbable. Sabbadisamo, always even. Yeah, Anenjo here is uh, un unperturbed, unstirred, uh, always even in the world. Uh. And um, this is um, kind of one of the beautiful characteristics that we are trying to also build up on the path, the idea of being imperturbable. Uh, because when you are imperturbable, it means that you are able to withstand any shocks in the world. Uh, nothing throws you off course. Uh, nothing is able to upset you. Uh, you can deal with anything. Uh, and of course this is what happens also when you practice samadhi in a very deep way. Uh, if you get into the jhana states or beyond the jhanas, uh, you are said to be anenja, unshakable, unstirred, uh, uh, imperturbable. Uh, and this allows you then to have full insight into the nature of reality, even though that insight can be hard to deal with. Yeah? Non seeing non-self is difficult because our clinging, our attachment to the idea of self is very strong. Yeah? That's why we need a very powerful mind to do that. Uh, the arahant always has that mind, always even. And this is one of the ways you can recognize people who are truly sages. Yeah? You recognize them in their evenness. How even is a person? Are they always kind of stable in the mind, or are they going up and down all the time? Uh, the person who can deal with any kind of situation, uh, any kind of difficult situation, that is the person who is most likely to be an arahant. Or, they have very good samadhi. How to tell the difference between an arahant and someone who has good samadhi? Very difficult to tell. Uh, and uh, you may not be able to tell, so you just... Uh, yeah, you just... I don't know what you do, you just... <laughs> You, uh, I guess you can keep on observing them for a long time and see what happens. Uh, when asked about one who is unshakable, I declare that is the benefit, uh, benefit of being an arahant again. Uh, not fawning. Uh, Ananugiddo, this one here. Yeah, fawning is a strange word. I don't know exactly what that's supposed to mean, to be honest with you. Uh, I, but Anugiddo usually means greedy, so it means something like not greedy. But I'm not sure why he has rendered it as fawning. But I, I guess he just had to have some random words. And uh, <laughs> Bhante Sujato, he likes words, he's a word person, so sometimes he comes up with words that no one else comes up with. Yeah. And so this is the, the, this is the thing. Yeah. 
he, he told me that he, his idea of translating the suttas was to make things as simple as possible so everyone can understand. But he obviously has failed. He has failed in this situation. Failed miserably. <laughs> hmm. Oh well. <laughs> Every A plant? Uh, Fawned? I don't think so. Not as far as I know, yeah, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, that's fawning, of course, yeah, but that, that's not the meaning here, is it? Uh, anyway, let's just let's, let's leave it to, to one side because it's uh, too difficult uh, to sort out now. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you fawn for example. Okay, yeah, sure. But that's why, yeah. Anyway, uh, for the unstirred who understand, there is no performance of deeds. Uh, uh, desisting from instigation, they see sanctuary everywhere. Uh, yeah, so if you are unstirred, uh, yeah, in other words, you have the evenness of mind, there is no performance of deeds. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, well, what it means is that you don't have any, you're no longer creating kamma at this point. Uh, you no longer do sankharas. Uh, you have no intentions in the world. You don't want to create a future for yourself. Uh, Remember that the idea of dependent origination, you have avidja, pachya, sankara, sankara, pachya, vinyana. The idea is because of ignorance, you do things in the world to create a good future for yourself. Yeah? This is the idea of sankaras. You're always trying to create the future. Yeah? But the person who is an arahant doesn't create a future anymore. They're not interested in the future. Yeah? They just live to do the right thing. And in that sense, they don't perform deeds. They don't make kamma anymore. They don't create these kind of things. Desisting from instigation. They also don't uh, in instigate anyone else. Or they don't start anything, right? Because they don't start anything, they don't go anywhere, they're not moving towards anything. They see sanctuary wherever they are right now. This is the sanctuary. There's nowhere else to go. There's nowhere to move. There's no future that is interesting. Right now is sanctuary because you've given up attachment to everything in the world. This is the idea of the Arahant. A sage doesn't speak of themselves as being among superiors, inferiors or equals. Peaceful, rid of stinginess, they neither take up nor reject. So it doesn't speak of themselves as being among superiors, uh, inferiors or equals. And again, this is the idea of overcoming conceit, right? Uh, there's no sense of superiority, inferiority or equality with other people. Uh, people are always changing. How can you measure yourself against someone who is always changing? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, yeah? When we measure, it's because we think we understand the other person. Uh, but we don't understand the other person. We don't know who they are. We don't know what their qualities are. Their qualities are always changing. So how can we measure ourselves against others? How can we feel superior or inferior or equal when there is not, nothing to measure by? To measure by, you need some quality that is inherent, that is always there. If the qualities are missing, everything is just change. A measurement becomes impossible. Peaceful, rid of stinginess, yeah? One of the beautiful qualities of the Arahant, they have no stinginess. Vita macharo, machara or macharo. And when you're rid of stinginess, it means that you are always generous in the world. And this is one of the qualities of the noble ones, that they are very generous. They're always willing to give. If you ask them for a favor, you ask them for you to give a talk, they ask you to do anything, they will almost always say yes, if they can, unless they are exhausted or they just too many things to do. This is one of the qualities of the sage, super duper generous. They neither take nor reject. Yeah, you never, you neither take things up, you neither attach to things, nor do you let go of things. And the reason why you don't take up or let go is because you have already finished, you have already, already let go of everything. There's nothing more to reject, there's nothing more to take up. And you're just happy with the way things are in the moment. Uh, you float through the world without being touched by the world. Uh, this is one of the kind of ideas of the Buddha. All right, that's a very brief going through of those things, the qualities of the Arahant. Um, 
let's uh, leave it at that for this sutta. You can still ask some questions if you wish. So let's just do a five minute meditation and we can uh, come back to some questions. So.
Okay. Okay, any uh, questions or comments or anyone like to say anything over here, uh, Bobby? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Venerable Sir, it seems beginning part of the Sutta is uh, Buddha is not enlightened yet, yeah. so he has this worry and fear. Whereas in the middle and the later part, yeah. he talk about hindrances and arahan that as if he's already enlightened so it seems to be like yeah it two parts it is two parts yeah. yeah i think i think the point is there's like a shift there remember there was a sentence in the middle you see a sentence in the middle let me go back i'll show you that it's a little bit of a strange sentence it seems to be added to make make that precise point if you go if you go up so here you see the sentence there in the parentheses uh, yeah this sentence here on that topic, the trainings are recited. Uh, yeah. So before that sentence, it talks about the Buddha to be and about all the problems that he was seeing in the world and how he saw the cause of the problem being the dart, being craving. Yeah. So that was kind of up to that point. And this is what the Buddha to be saw before the awakening. Yeah. And then from that sentence onwards, uh, it's like he is shifting from that perspective to talking about the teaching, his own teaching. Yeah talking about the training that needs to be done to overcome those problems. Uh, there's a, as if there is a, a shift, there's a slightly comp composite sutta composed of, on the one hand, uh, his biography, on the other hand, the training that he discovers through his awakening. Yeah. And then the result of that training, which is the arahanship at the very end. Uh, yeah. So yes, yeah, so it's a little bit, um, little bit funny in that way, the sutta, quite right. Uh, yeah. Ajahn, uh, in the in the beginning part uh, of this beautiful uh, sutta, could you could you could we say this is a sutta in 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 poetry form, or how how is this said uh, in proper uh, name? Because it's not a is it poetry or, or how how you call it? What, uh, it, it's a gata, gata form. A gata, gata, gata and, yeah. And and how in English? How would it be? Uh, Just call it verse form. Verse form. Verse, verse form. form. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. In verse form. That's verse what form. I was. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 the the beginning part where he uh, uh, expresses the the, the problem, uh, the line, uh, want, wanting a home for myself. Yeah. I saw no nowhere unsettled. Yeah. It, this line reminded me of a line that I that I remembered in in my own language German, that, uh, yeah. uh, and I tried to to translate it into English. Uh, it it came out uh, something like no abide no abiding stead we have on this earth. Uh -huh. No okay. abiding stead we have on this earth, or no permanent home we have we have here. Yeah. And uh, this line, uh, I know it, it is in it, it's in the Bible. Okay. So I want just it came to my I, I want to mention that uh, yeah. that all all religion uh, are aware of this problem and they yeah. talk about the self. Yeah. It's basically the self pro the same problem. Uh, it is the same just, problem. Just to it? mention. Yeah. This. Yeah. Because obviously, Christian also would be uh, aware that this life has an end; it comes to an end, and everything is impermanent. And then, uh, you know, and then you're hoping for some permanence somewhere else. Uh, and uh, so, it's a similar kind of problem. So, yes, I think any any wise person will be able to see that if you are wise. It's wisdom that is really the critical thing. Uh, the question then is, how good is the solution? Uh, and that solution will then vary a little bit from religion to religion. Uh, yeah. So yes, okay, thank you for that. I, I must admit I have been very badly educated. I have no idea about Christianity. I know nothing about Christianity. I grew up in a family that was not religious at all. Uh, so I kind of, uh, I know nothing about, uh, I grew up in a so-called Christian culture, but I know nothing about it. Uh, and I'm quite happy actually with that, to be honest with you. Uh, so, <laughs> being naughty. Yes.
Ajahn, uh, I would like to know, based on the sutta, uh, did Buddha mention how long would it take for one to become an arahan? Wow, that is anything from one second to uh, to in innumerable eons, yeah, somewhere in between one second and innumerable eons. <laughs> So that really depends on you, right? It depends on what you make of this practice and how inspired you feel and all of these kind of things. So there is no standard time frame. And um, uh, if you're going to do it in one second, you have to be on, you have to be already practiced almost the whole path. Yeah. And then the, the speaker of the practice all the way to the end, bang, it can happen very, very quickly. Uh, but uh, for most people, it uh, will take time. Uh, but uh, the best thing to do is just to feel that sense of urgency. Now is the opportunity. Uh, if you don't do it now, when are you going to do it? Uh, probably never. Uh, yeah, there is only now. The only chance you have is now. So please do it now. Uh, and uh, it begins with simple things, right? It begins with we tend to complicate the path too much. We wonder how should I really practice? But actually, it's very simple. Uh, be kind. Uh, have compassion for the people around you. Don't get angry. There's no nothing, no reason to get angry in the world, right? Uh, people don't know what they're doing. How can you be? Angry with blind people, with deluded people, doesn't make any sense. So you just get into those things, do those very simple things. That is where the path is at. Be generous, be kind to everyone around you. See what you can do for them. And it kind of when you open up your heart to the world in this way, life becomes very beautiful and very powerful. That is really what it is about. And these are the simple things. And then if you do those things really, really well and in a very profound way, then meditation becomes so easy. You wonder, how come I never could do meditation before? Now it's so easy, <laughs> right? It's like, it just happens. And this is one of those things about the suttas where it says that meditation is an automatic process. It's dhammata. It happens according to nature. All you have to do is put in place the causes of the path. And when you put those play causes, the root cause into place, the whole process just happens by itself. All you have to do is sit back and you watch the process happen. Yeah. That's what it is all about. But this is kind of the, the idea of this path. Uh, the hard part is to be kind all the time. That's the hard part. Uh, it's hard, not because it's difficult to do, but it's hard because it goes against the grain, against our habits, uh, against the way we have been conditioned. That's why it is hard. So we need to recondition ourselves. Uh, this is the most difficult thing of the whole path, the reconditioning of the super tanker. We are each one super tanker. Uh, super tanker because the conditioning is so strong. We have a tremendous momentum in one direction. And to turn that momentum around is like turning a super tanker around. Uh, it takes kilometers and kilometers and kilometers uh, to come around and come in a different direction. Uh. Yeah, yes, please. Um, Ajahn, um, looking at all the different qualities of the Arhan, um, Arhans are not necessarily Buddhist, right? They can be someone, who, <laughs> let's say like Mother Teresa example. Yeah, you think she was an Arhant? <laughs> um, are they Buddhist? Well, it depends what you mean by Buddhist. I mean, they don't wear a label, I'm a Buddhist, you know, that's for sure. Huh? But um, are they Buddhist? Well, they are Buddhist in the sense that they have the same insight as the Buddha. They have the same, is the Buddha a Buddhist? I don't know. I mean, the Buddha is, he wasn't a Buddhist before he became a Buddhist, but once you have that insight, what does it mean to be a Buddhist? It means to have refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Any Arahant will take refuge in the Buddha Dhamma Sangha because they know what these things are. That is their refuge. They have become the Dhamma. They are these things. So I would say that they are Buddhist. Even if they don't call themselves Buddhist, they're still Buddhists. Mother Teresa, was she, was she an Arahant? I, I have my doubts, to be honest with you. <laughs> but I mean, she was many, many good qualities, but it, it's one thing to have many good qualities, a very different thing to be an Arahant. Uh, it, it's kind of a world transcending thing here. Yeah. So I would say, uh, if you're an Arahant, I would say you're a Buddhist. Yeah. <laughs> it's good news, isn't it? <laughs> Otherwise, Christian Arahants, I don't know about that. Uh, we, <laughs> Please, uh, yeah. Um, Bhante, uh, I'd like to ask you about the Jataka tales. Mm. Um, my, my, both my children, they question the logic of those tales. Because 
they have been going through Sunday school since young. So they have come to a point, it's just not logical to them. Yeah. And, and it um, sort of kills their interest in yeah. walking this path. But uh, Sunday schools are still, uh, it also comes back to tradition, like you say. Some monks, they do stress on it. And when I pointed it out, it didn't sit lightly on them. So how, how, how do I advise my... I would say no need to go to Sunday school. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, the, the Sunday school is like a Christian tradition. Yeah, it's kind of taken from Christianity, and then it was accepted by Buddhists because um, uh, because Westerners came to Asia and they thought, yeah, Christians have so maybe we should have it as well. And so Buddhists had Sunday school, but we never had Sunday school before. Uh, just a new thing. I, the thing is that if you being a Buddhist is actually very demanding it, it 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 needs you know you need to have an interest in practicing and living well uh, and a child cannot really decide those things uh, i would say you only become a buddhist when you become an adult yeah maybe in your te late teens at the earliest uh, yeah maybe s mid teens uh, but uh, it's very hard to be have a child who is a buddhist and i think sometimes uh, the best way to make a buddhist child is to be a good parent uh, yeah to show kind of through your example the living in a good way and then when they become all think oh my mom is a buddhist my mom was a great person she was the most wonderful mom anyone can possibly have maybe i should become a buddhist as well <laughs> that is that is the way right you live by example and suddenly it happens because of the example but uh, i don't know if sending kids to sunday school is a good idea if especially if they don't like it uh, let them play, yeah, let them enjoy, let them kind of uh, kick a football around. I don't know what people do here in Malaysia, but, but what, whatever it is, you know, and uh, have a good time, have some time off. There's so much pressure in this world already. Yeah. Anyway, I'm just saying random stuff, but anyway, there you are. Yeah. But, but to be that example, right, I find it difficult. My kid did put that to me as well. Uh, if you want me to be as what the Buddha is, then why not you become <laughs> one first? So, yeah. So yeah, so hence how, then I, I, I told them, let's walk the path together. Yeah. Then, yeah. Yeah. to my boy, it's like, uh, it's so, like, like you say, Ajahn, it's so pessimistic. He say everything is so dark and gloomy. <laughs> so, yeah. so, the more I share, the more they are going further away. So how? You don't, don't. don't. Don't focus on the pessimistic, focus on the positive. Uh, focus on the happiness, the joy of, of, of living well, of doing the right thing, of practicing meditation. Buddhism is full of happiness, absolutely packed with it. Uh, the problem is that we often sell the wrong thing. We sell Buddhism, we sell all the negative sides. Uh, and there's actually happiness everywhere. The whole path is about happiness. Buddhism is about how to be happy. That's the whole point of Buddhism. Uh, yeah, but of course, the way that is presented in the suttas, the suttas are profound, they are deep. They're not for everyone to understand. And when we present it in the wrong way, people uh, kind of grasp it in the wrong way and they think it is pessimistic. Yeah. But I think a child is not ready to hear these teachings very often. You know, you should give, it should come, I think, at the right age when they are ready and they start to understand what is uh, required in, and they start to question life and this kind of thing. Maybe that is the right time to become a Buddhist. Uh, it's very hard to, for a child to make these kind of decisions, I think. Yeah. So I wouldn't. If I were, I wouldn't worry about it. Just let your children be children, you know. Uh, let, them do, <laughs> let them do their thing and enjoy themselves uh, and uh, not try to make them into Buddhists because, uh, you know, they, um, they, they will have to make that decision at some point down the road. Uh. <laughs> Please, do you have some advice to give? Or, uh, here's uh, I think that I... Yeah. I do find that some of the Jakarta tales are a bit too strong. Mm -hmm. For example, like, you know, he jumped and allowed himself to be eaten by the tiger, mm. right? Mm. So, if an adult can't see that, I don't think the child <laughs> will want to know that, you know, oh, I'm going to feed myself to the tiger. Mm. So, I think it's not really that wise sometimes mm. to uh, go through the, all the, the Jataka deals with the children. Mm. Right. I think having them to come for Sunday school is maybe you should give them some joy. Yeah. Um, allow them to play. Yeah. Uh, creativity, yeah. craft. Yeah. Right. More than I think sharing the Jataka deals. Yeah. Okay. Right. Good. Yeah. 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 
So um, I, that's a good point. Maybe there are other ways of doing the Sunday school that are more positive, not so negative. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much input you have in what they do. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, yeah. So if you, if your children are saying it is too dark and so you know, listen to listen to your kids. You know, they have a point. Don't force them too much because then that may be counterproductive. Uh, so find that middle way somewhere. You know, try to be wise about this. Uh, it's sometimes difficult to be wise, but you have to try your best. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very glad I'm not a parent, I have to admit. Whoa, so hard, so hard to be a parent. <laughs> I got out of that one, oh, I'm very, very, <laughs> just in time. So, <laughs> okay, let's, uh, let's carry on a little bit then. So, uh, now what we're going to do, and this is now this is going to be even more wild, right? Are you ready for something, something wild? Um, er, hey, hey. Okay. So. Um, this is going to be a sutta that you probably have never heard of before. And this is called the Great Dreams. Yeah, and, I, and sometimes I thought, okay, it's nice, let's do something that I haven't done. I, can't, I don't think I've done this here before. And so I thought, let's do something different. Maybe I have done it before, maybe I'm just kind of deluding myself. But anyway, this is uh, quite unusual. The five great dreams of the Bodhisattva, of the Buddha before his awakening, right? So let's have a have a look at this, just as a kind of slightly different uh, um, approach to the Dhamma. And please, did I did I lose it? Ah, because I did that one there. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. No. 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 Where is it? <laughs> so. Um, there's so many different angles on the Dhamma, and this is part of the things that happened to the Buddha before his awakening. He had these great dreams, and they were part of the cause of the awakening of the Buddha. And that's kind of ex extraordinary, right? Uh, and uh, so I thought that might be interesting, just for a bit of fun. It is not kind of super deep Dhamma, anything like that, uh, just as a kind of alternative. Just like your kids want fun and in the Sunday school, we're going to have sun today is Sunday, Sunday school, yeah, five great dreams. Okay, <laughs> this is fun for everyone. So there you, there you are. Yeah. So uh, this is uh, this is it. So let's have a quick look at this sutta. This is from the Anguttara Nikaya Fives. This is the numerical discourses of the Buddha, the fifth book, the Fives, sutta number hundred and ninety-six. So it's way out there somewhere. This is how the sutta goes, right? Mendicants, before his awakening, five great dreams appeared to the realized one, the perfected one, the fully awakened Buddha. When he was still not awake, but intent on awakening. Uh, okay, slightly unusual phrasing. Anyway, so here we have the same thing we had before. Remember that it's here saying that this happened to him before the Buddha, very clearly indicated, uh, while he was still a bodhisattva, intent on awakening. is said very clearly here. So we know that this happened to the Buddha, maybe while he was practicing, yeah, maybe under the two teachers, some, sometime during this period, uh, he would have had this kind of five great dreams, maha supina, great dreams. So what are these five great dreams? This great earth was his bed. Himalaya, the king of mountains, was his pillow. His left hand was laid down on the eastern sea. His right hand lay down on the western sea. And both his feet were laid down in the southern ocean. Right, this is this is a dream that the uh, the Buddha to be had before his awakening here. 
That's kind of interesting. What does this mean? So um, you will notice here that uh, he, the great earth, right? Uh, the, uh, basically his head is resting on the Himalaya, which is the north, very north of India. And then the southern ocean, these are the oceans around India. So when we're talking about the great earth, in those days the great earth basically was India. That was the great earth, yeah? They didn't really know about anything outside of India. They just knew about that. Uh, so it was a very kind of small kind of area. And anyone who lived from outside of India, that they maybe had heard about, uh, they were the barbarians. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Every culture is like that. Uh, our culture is the center of the world. The people outside, they are the barbarians. Uh, Every culture of the world is the same. Ancient India was also just like that. Uh, and it's kind of fascinating how we always think of ourselves as the most evolved, the highest, we are the best. Everyone else, they are kind of uh, dodgy characters. Uh. <laughs> and so that is the... Uh, yeah, so the, so the, his bed was the whole earth. So you get an idea here that the Buddha is like encompassing everything. Right? He's kind of... He has this idea, this future vision of some kind of whether he is like encompasses the whole world in a sense uh, with his personality. Uh. And interesting, the Himalaya mountains, uh, the Himalaya mountains, right? Uh, these are known as the king of mountains even today. They are the greatest mountains on the earth. Uh, and uh, the, so the, these mountains are often called like the center of the world. Uh, the uh, Axis Mundi, I think they're sometimes called. They are like the uh, the the um, kind of the, uh, the the core of what the earth kind of revolves around these mountains. So when you take these mountains as your pillow, it says something about that you are taking kind of your. It's almost like you become uh, you are above everything in the world, right? Uh, and you kind of become superior to everything. You rise above everything uh, because even these mountains are just your pillow. These which are the core or center of the earth, so to speak. Uh. And then you left. Hand uh, uh, lay down in the eastern ocean, the right hand in the western ocean, uh, and uh, your feet uh, in the southern ocean. Uh, it means that the whole world is encompassed uh, by this, by your body. You are kind of larger than everything here. Yeah. So uh, this is this idea that the Buddha, and we shall see later on, the meaning of this dream uh, is basically that the Buddha becomes awakened. Uh, the moment you ha are awakened, uh, you have a vision of the whole world, understanding of the whole world, uh, and the whole world is encompassed uh, within that vision. Uh, so awakening is larger than anything else. Uh. So th this is kind of interesting. So what is this about? Why does the Buddha have this? Uh, what is going on here? What is the purpose of this? Why does the Buddha even say these things? Uh? And um, the purpose seems to be that the I assume that the, this had an effect on the Buddha-to-be, right? Uh, when he had these kind of dreams, maybe that strengthened his idea that he was on the right track, that he was moving towards some kind of future state of really understanding, of comprehending the world properly. Uh, if you know a little bit about dreams, one of the interesting things about dreams, it is quite common to have prophetic dreams, uh, to dream about the future. Yeah, It's quite a common thing. Dreams can be very random, they can be about all kinds of stuff. Uh, but there are certain dreams that even if you are an Arahant, even if you're fully enlightened, uh, because they're not based on delusion, they're based on prophecy or understanding the future, uh, actually they um, uh, may be possible even for Arahants. Of course, he's not an Arahant yet, uh, but he's ob obviously very pure already at this point. Uh. And so maybe this kind of added to his belief and faith that he was on the right track. This may have been a motivating force yeah, I've already talking about dying and death, and of course these are the important ones, but these dreams may have added a little bit uh, to that motivating force. Uh, and I think this says something about the ancient Indian society. They're very different from our societies. Uh, if you tell someone that you had a prophetic dream, uh, what would people say to you? They say, you're nuts. They say, say what are you talking about, prophetic dreams? There's no such thing, you're just dreaming. Right, so so the the thing about the ancient Indian society was more open to these kind of things. Uh, they believed in rebirth. They believed in karma. They believed in the power of mind in a very different way from what we do now. Uh, and because of that, they were probably open to the idea of prophetic dreams. Uh, so in that culture, in that setting, uh, a prophetic dream may have been very powerful. 
because actually you think maybe it is true. Huh? In our present day, we wouldn't even cons we wouldn't necessarily think about it. Actually, I've heard of people who've had dreams about the, the future. They've had kind of very clear dreams about a place they were going to go, a house that looked in a certain way, and suddenly they were really surprised because after traveling somewhere, there was that house that they had seen in that dream. It was like, wow, this is exactly the house I saw in that dream last week. And it's kind of, how is that possible? And it's, you know, a house is often very, if it is a, a nice house, it is very specific. It is made for that person. It only exists one of those houses in the whole world. So if you see that house in the dream, you know it is the same house. So that's kind of awesome. So these things, I think that these things are probably possible. There is quite a lot of evidence, apparently, that these things are possible. So in the right kind of society, these things may actually have a certain power. They may have a certain influence. And so I think for the Buddha to be, these dreams may actually have been a motivating factor in his awakening. So here he has this dream of encompassing the whole earth, right? And it's like, what's going on here? And then, of course, what's going on is the sense that now I have this broad, the Buddha has this broad vision of existence and of reality here. Let's just read the uh, read them first. I'll come back to the meaning afterwards. Uh, this is the first great dream that appeared to the realized one before his awakening. Uh, next, a kind of grass called the crosser grew up from his navel and stood pressing against the cloudy sky. I'll just read them out and we can discuss them in a second. This is the second dream that appeared to the realized one before his awakening. Next, white caterpillars with black heads crawled from his feet and covered his knees. <laughs> Strange dreams. Yeah. This is the third great dream that appeared to the realized one before his awakening. Next, four birds of different colors came from the four directions. They fell at his feet, turning pure white. This is the fourth dream that appeared to the realized one before his awakening. Next, he walked back and forth on the top of a huge mountain of filth while remaining unsoiled. This is the fifth great dream that appeared to the realized one before his awakening. Yeah. So let's see what these things mean. Now as to when before his awakening the realized one, the perfected one, the fully awakened Buddha was still not awake but intent on awakening, this great earth was his bed. Himalaya, the king of mountain, was his pillow. His left hand was laid down in the eastern sea, the right hand in the western sea, both feet in the southern sea. This was fulfilled when the Buddha awakened to the perfect awakening. Yeah. So as I said, this dream basically meant that he, was, uh, he achieved the awakening, yeah, the all-encompassing wis wisdom of understanding the world and the nature of reality. Yeah. As to when a kind of grass called the crosser grew up from his navel and stood pressing against the cloudy sky. Yeah, so uh, the idea here of the grass growing up from the navel apparently is quite a common idea. It also existed in Brahmanism or Hinduism at the time. Uh, and the idea seems to be that you're connecting the earth with a higher realm. Here the sky can be considered either, it can be considered the Devaloka, which the Brahmanical teaching wanted you people to get reborn in the Devaloka with Brahma, or in Buddhism, it can be considered maybe as Nibbana. Yeah? You grow out uh, and the grass, the crosser, the, in other words, it is the grass which crosses over samsara, right? It cross, goes across uh, and it goes from the sh this shore of ordinary worldly existence to Nibbana on the other side. Uh, yeah? It is the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, the path that is, uh, uh, is kind of, this is a simile for, right? Uh, you're moving from one place to another one. Huh? Pressing against the cloudy sky, going all the way out as far as you, you can possibly see. Huh? 
This was fulfilled when, after the Buddha awakened to the Noble Eightfold Path, it was proclaimed wherever, wherever there are gods and humans. It allows you to cross and move beyond, and this has a meaning in that context of ancient India. And of course the Buddha-to-be, he would have understood that, because this was part of that uh, tradition and culture at the time. As to the white caterpillars with black heads crawled up from its heat and covered his feet and covered his knees, yeah, and uh, white caterpillars with black heads, and uh, I I saw a picture of these caterpillars because uh, these caterpillars apparently they exist. There are such caterpillars with black heads and white bodies. Do you have them here in Malaysia? You haven't seen them? Okay, you haven't seen them. You have you have you have missed out. <laughs> And they're very cute caterpillars. I saw them, black heads and white bodies. They have, they're very quite, uh, they're quite nice. Can you imagine what they what they are? What might they be? Well, imagine the Indians, right? The ancient Indians, they have quite dark skin sometimes. So the head is dark, and then they wear white clothes, yeah, because they are the upasakas. So the caterpillars with Black heads and white, they are the, the upasakas, right? They are the lay followers of the Buddha. Yeah? And then they crawl from the feet up to the knees, right? And I, th I, I don't know exactly why that is, but the feet are the lowest part of the body, yeah? according to Buddhism. So when you crawl from the feet, it's like you're starting out very low, and then you crawl upwards, yeah? and you become more purified in that movement, maybe up, I don't know why it stops at the knees, but anyway, it stops at the knees. So, and uh, <laughs> should go maybe to the head, I'm not sure. So, uh, this is the idea here, probably behind this, yeah, the white caterpillars crawling up, all the lay people. So, you're all a bit caterpillars, you feel like caterpillars? <laughs> so, anyway, so, um, Caterpillars, caterpillars. Maybe call. Maybe you should call calling each other caterpillars, yeah, instead of brothers and sisters. Call them. Hey, caterpillar, how are you today? Yeah. <laughs> See, <laughs> there's a new idea for you. Sheep, sheep. Okay, the black heads and white bodies. Uh, sheep. Okay. This was fulfilled when many white-clothed lay people went for refuge to him for life. This was the third, thir third great dream that appeared to him while he was still not awakened. Caterpillars, caterpillars. <laughs> As to when the four birds of different colors came from the four quarters, they fell at his feet, turning pure white. Yeah? Um, so the... Can, you can imagine what this is. The four birds are the four castes in India. Yeah, in ancient India they had four castes. They had the Brahmins, uh, they had the uh, Kshatriyas, the kind of the administrative class. Uh, yeah, the um, the warriors, uh, and then you had the uh, Ves, uh, the Vesas, uh, which are the kind of merchant class, and you had the Sudras or the Sudras, uh, which are like the the workers or the even you know whatever else. Uh. And uh, so what he is saying here is that when uh, you come to the Buddha and you ordain, you lose your status of your caste. Yeah? When you become a monk or a nun, you no longer belong to the caste. You just become a disciple of the Buddha. You lose the colors you had before and you turn white. And again, this idea of white, yeah, being pure, is a kind of this idea of purity. You're living well. Now you are measured by your purity and not by your birth. And this is what we find in the suttas all the time, the idea that we are measured by our purity, we are measured by our virtue. Virtue is what actually gives the sense of whether someone is a good person or not where they were born. So this is the, one of the beautiful things about the uh, Sangha, is that you should lose all that kind of status is left behind when you enter the Sangha. And you don't actually have those kind of status symbols anymore. Huh? And this is a very important thing to remember because in the modern world uh, some of the idea of caste is kind of returning to the Sangha again. Uh, and there are places where caste actually has is said to be significant and important and even used within the Sangha. You cannot enter the Sangha unless you belong to a certain caste. And that is kind of really 
bad idea, and it really goes completely against how the Buddha taught these things. Uh, but it's also important to remember that the Buddha didn't really try to abolish the caste in India. He wasn't as if he tried, he wasn't a social reformer. It's just that within the Sangha itself, uh, the caste were abandoned, and what measured you as a person was actually whether you were living well or not. Uh, um, the uh, people who are called the superior people in the suttas are the people who are the Aryas, the noble ones, the stream enterers. Uh, and it's kind of one of the nice ironies uh, is that uh, even though they are called superior, of course, if you are a noble one, you don't feel superior. Yeah, you have given up all the conceit. Uh, you have given up the idea of measuring yourself against other people. So you are superior precisely because you have given up superiority. <laughs> yeah? That's kind of the weird thing about these things. Uh, and this is part of this kind of movement towards that uh, giving up of the caste. This was fulfilled when members of the four castes, uh, the aristocrats, the Brahmins, the merchants and the workers, uh, Went forth, from, went forth from lay life to homelessness in the teaching and training proclaimed by the realized one and realized supreme freedom. Okay, and realized supreme freedom. So also the realization is also part of that. Aristocrats is the word that Sujata used for kattiyas or kshatriyas. So I guess that is an acceptable translation. I wonder... Mm. Anyway, let's go on. This was the fourth dream that appeared to him while he was not still not awakened. As to when he walked back and forth on top of a huge mountain of filth while remaining unsoiled. Yeah, what do you think this might be? Huh? Walking back and forth on a huge mountain of filth while remaining unsoiled. Well, this could mean a number of different things. Yeah, one of the things that, uh, what was that? Uh, defilements, uh, yeah, so, a huge amount of defilements, uh, okay, yeah. Yes, I think that's basically what it comes down to, yeah. There, in, elsewhere in the suttas, the Buddha talks about like the lotuses who grow in the pond, yeah, and uh, sometimes the lotus grows out of the pond, uh, no longer soiled by the water, you stand above the earth. Uh, and the Buddha, even though the Buddha is part of the world, he still belongs in the world, he's also above the world, he's no longer touched by the world. The defilements, all the things of the world are kind of left behind. This is one way of looking at this, but actually the meaning here is slightly different. And here you, here you go for the meaning. This was fulfilled when the realized one received robes, arms, food, lodgings, and medicines and supplies for the sick. And he used them uh, untied, uninfatuated, unattached, seeing the drawbacks and understanding the escape. Yeah, so um, uh, the last thing that you have as a monk or a nun uh, is you have the four requisites, yeah? the alms, food, the lodgings and the medicines. Uh, and uh, these are the things that you have, uh, the robes. Uh, and uh, of course it is very easy to become attached to these, th these things. You want to have a nice kuti, just right. You want to have the nice robes. Yeah, it has to be the right kind of material, not some dodgy material, the real deal. Uh, you want to have a bowl with the right kind of bowl stand. Uh, you will be surprised in, th in many places around the world, there is fashion in bowl stands. There is fashion in monks' requisites. Uh, and you have to have the latest kind of requisite. Uh, is that still happening in Thailand, Venable? If people have, are fashionable fashion requisites. Is that, have you seen this happening? Uh, the nuns in Thailand are too pure to get into this kind of thing. So well done. I'm very happy about that. Uh, but I have seen these things happening and the kind of, the, there has to be the right kind of thing, otherwise it's not. So it's very easy to get into this kind of silliness, uh, even as a monastic. Uh, I think the monks, are, I think the monks, uh, they are, the nuns are pure. The nuns are very pure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, oh, very embarrassing to be a monk. You have <laughs> so it's true, though. So it's actually very easy to get it. You know, it can happen very easily because you're still into these kind of things. But uh, um, uh, if you are a good 
uh, monastic, you don't really bother about such things because you realize it's just a residue of attachment. So the Buddha calls it filth, right? It's not interesting here. So whenever you give a requisite to a monk, if the monk or nun thinks of it as filth, please give me that filth, then uh, <laughs> you're doing something positive, right? So don't take it personally if they call it filth. You know, even the Buddha called it filth. Here is some filthy food for you. Yeah, when you offer the breakfast in the morning, please accept this filth. <laughs> you can try that tomorrow morning if you are around and see what happens. <laughs> it's fascinating. I, it's, uh, uh, don't, I mean, uh, what is so interesting about when you become an arahant is you have the ability to see things in exactly the way you want to see things, in depending on the circumstances. Uh, so on the one hand, if you think there is a danger of attachment, uh, you can see it as filth. Yeah, Actually, real happiness doesn't come from this. This is a lower kind of happiness. I'm not really interested in that. Uh, that's one side of the arahant kind of idea. On the other hand, uh, if you are a good meditator, you tend to enjoy the things of the world much more because you can really taste that food. Uh, because you don't have any craving, because your mind is pure, you can fully appreciate the flavor of the food. Uh, and it says in the sutta that if someone comes out of a jhana state uh, and you get an ordinary meal of really plain food, yeah, you don't get that plain food here in BGF. Here you only get the super best food. Uh, I get the super duper food every day. It's very kind of you. I appreciate that. But maybe you should uh, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if, but even if you get really really plain food, the Buddha, it, it sounds like the king's meal. That's what it tastes like because your mind is so pure. Right, very often when we eat, have you noticed when you eat, you are eating, you're eating one spoon, and while you're eating, that's when you're already looking for the next one. What are you going to have next? Uh, craving is there while you're eating. You're always looking for something more. You're never really staying what you're doing. It's true, isn't it? It's very, it's, it's so, how, 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 how life, what it's like. But because the Arahant doesn't have that, uh, they're fully able to enjoy what they're happening right now. So the robes they have are like the best cloth in the world. The dodgy food they get yeah, is the best food in the world. And that's how they also see it. So being an arahant is like having this ability to shift your perception all the time, depending on the situation, to really appreciate it, but also to see it as something low at the same time, or whatever. This is kind of the arahant mind. It's a very flexible mind that can change perception very fast because of that uh, being able to see different sides of things. So um, just to give you a more balanced view of this, uh, it is not just filth, it is actually more to it than that. Uh, but it is filth when you are attached to it. Uh, that is the problem. The attachment is the problem, not the thing in itself. This was the fifth great dream that appeared to him while he was still not awakened. Before his awakening, these five great dreams appeared to the realized one, the perfected one, the fully awakened Buddha, while he was still not awake, but intent on awakening. So these were the things, and they obviously gave him a little bit of something that made it even more possible, motivated, to actually practice the path all the way. So, anyway, just a bit of fun for you, just to do something a little bit different. And uh, now let us do a little bit of meditation together again.
Okay. So, um, uh, if you have any questions or comments again, please, now is a good time to ask. Venerable, at the front. Uh, at the very front here, Bobby. Uh, the Venerable. Uh, Punsiri. Punsirivara. Yeah. <laughs> I listened to uh, Ajahn Sombat, Thai monk. Uh -huh. He was teaching uh, Tipitaka. He talked about uh, dream. He said that Arahan has no dream. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's true. I, I'm not sure, but I think the, the problem with dream is that dream is usually considered to be delusion. Huh? And Arahant cannot have delusion, right? Uh, and that's why they say Arahant has no dreams, because dream is delusion. But if there may be some dreams that are not delusion. Huh? And I think a prophetic dream may be one of the exceptions to delusion. Huh? And because it is a prophetic dream, maybe, maybe an Arahant can have prophetic dream. Maybe not. Pro probably not. Uh, but I'm just wondering if it might be possible in certain situations. Uh, the reason he says that is probably from the commentary. It's probably not, it doesn't say anywhere in the suttas that uh, Arahant cannot have dream. Uh, so it is probably some commentarial tradition. And so it may not be 100% reliable, uh, but maybe it's true. Maybe it is true. Yeah. Not, I'm not sure what the answer, what do you think? I don't know. I am still had dreams sometimes, so I thought, well, I'm not Arahant. Are you Arahant? Not Arahant. Not Arahant. Okay, okay. So, so we haven't pro proven anything by the, Some, you having dreams. Sometimes okay. I have yeah. dreams, but vain, you know, yeah. not yeah. too often. When you, bec when you become Arahant, please let us know, and we'll we, we, we know. <laughs> we'll find out. <laughs> I want to ask this question now. Yeah. Arahashi is achieved in this lifetime or after death? S say again? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I, I, I want to know Arahashi is achieved in this present lifetime or after death? Arahant is achieved in this life. This yeah? life? Yeah. So there's no excuse. Oh, because, uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. because in, uh, in, uh, those, in uh, those who are following the Mahayana tradition, uh, Arahant is uh, someone who is uh, not in this realm, you know? Oh, I, I okay. I think maybe they have the different, maybe different kinds of arahants. Uh. Oh, I see. I see. But uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, one of the things about the Buddhist teaching, which I think is very important about Buddhism, is that everything can be achieved in this life. That's kind of this is what makes Buddhism different from almost all other religions. Because other religions, you have to wait till after you die to find out whether there is a god or not. Is there a god? Don't know. If there isn't, after you die, tough luck. You made a bad choice, right? Uh, and you, you uh, <laughs> there is no god there. But in Buddhism, the whole point is that we can know in this life. And that is what is so beautiful about these teachings. Uh, yeah. Okay, yes, uh, please. I have one question. Yeah. <clears throat> Looking at this sutta, I would never guess what the dream actually meant. Not a single one of them. S -s Sorry? I look at this sutta, I would never guess what the dream actually meant. Right. Even for a single one of them. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. so difficult. Yeah. But in Malaysia, it's really easy. When you have a dream, you consult a book, we tell you what number to buy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, so what shall we... So that's the... Uh, okay. Uh -huh, so... <laughs> okay, not sure what the conclusion to draw from that one. But anyway, we'll leave it, leave it let it be, let it rest. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Anyone else, please? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, Bhante, uh, one more question from my kids. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, they asked me what is Nibbana, because after going to Sunday school and they've been drilling to them, Nibbana, Nibbana. Mm. Uh, when they asked the teacher, teacher said that's the ultimate state. What is the ultimate state? It's the ultimate state. <laughs> so, so they came home and they asked me. So I said... Um, after listening to your videos on YouTube, right, um, yeah. and Ajahn Brahm, mm, we are all made up of energy, right? So I told them, Nibbana is a state whereby the energy calms down. Uh -huh. So, uh, and then Ajahn Brahm did say in one of his videos that uh, we are made up of atoms, uh, nucleus and all, and, and we are all vibrating. Uh. 
due to the energy. Yeah. Because kids nowadays, they are very, they, they, they need something to be tangible and yeah. it needs to be proven, especially scientifically for my kids. Lah. So um, I based it on that. So I want to know, is that correct? The way uh-huh. I um, yeah, I think it is not not a bad answer. Yeah, because things calm down, the vibrations stop. I mean, it's kind of the uh, you know, there's obviously a lot of truth to that. Uh, calm nibbana is the highest kind of peace. But uh, I, I would say, if a kid asks you what nibbana is, I would say it's the highest happiness, because this is what everyone wants. Uh, yeah, everyone wants to be happy, so it's the highest kind of happiness you can have as a human being. That's nibbana. That kind of takes away some of the problem here. Huh? Because for my kids, um, yeah. the definition of highest happiness yeah. differs from one another due to perceptions. They have learned this word, perceptions. It depends on the perception. Yeah, of an individual. So they told me, Mommy, yeah. your Nibbana and my Nibbana is two different <laughs> things. <laughs> So well, you have, to, you have to tell them, remember that the spiritual path develops you and it changes you as a person. So it, it is different from different people as long as you are undeveloped in mind, undeveloped through meditation practice. But when you practice the meditation all the way and you follow the path, then actually that changes. And that perception of Nibbana is the same for everyone, precisely because you go through a process of development. So you, you don't know what Nibbana is if you haven't developed the mind. That's why the perception is different for everyone. Huh? So you have to go through the process first of all. Huh? So you have to tell them there's a path to get there. Only when you come to the end of the path do you understand this kind of happiness. You cannot understand it with the present mind. So there is a movement towards that. But what you can know, huh? and this is kind of the idea, you can know that uh, when the mind is peaceful, when you ha- have a good day and everyone is kind and everyone is pleasing, then you feel more happy. And when the mind is really agitated and everyone is nasty and, and difficult, then it's more difficult. And so when Nibbana means things are calming down, things are more happy, uh, yeah? That is the movement towards Nibbana when things are calm and peaceful. That is a little bit of Nibbana. It gives you a foretaste for the real Nibbana, which is the absolute calm, the absolute stillness, and therefore also the highest happiness. Uh. So ask them, okay, when do you feel really happy? Yeah, and they will give you some idea of. Uh, it can be depend. I don't. How how old are your kids? Twelve and thirteen. Twelve and thirteen. Okay, yeah. still very young, and it can be hard to kind of get their heads around some of these things, right? Uh, yeah. So it, it just just so you just have to tell them that there is a there is a happiness which is the same for everyone, and that is the ha- high happinesses of nibbana, but it only appears when you practice the path fully. Uh, you can practice the path a little bit now by being kind, and you have a little bit of idea of what Nibbana is, but it goes much further than that. Um, there's another thing, Ajahn. Uh, you said not to send them to Sunday school, right? I, I can't, Ajahn, <laughs> because um, yeah. in school, right, there are Christian kids. Mm. When my kid told them that um, they are Buddhist, yeah. then they said, oh, Buddha is a devil. How can you follow that? So, um, then they come back and tell me, Mommy, this, uh, uh, when I say that I'm a <coughs> Buddhist, this is what I'm called. Yeah. <coughs> that the Christians have a way of finding loopholes and they start the kids young, Bhante. That, that is why I notice a lot drop out walking this path, even at a very young age. And we as parents, we are going through a lot of struggle because, um, yeah. um, how to say, uh, it, it, everything is not tangible, Bhante. You know, these two days, right? It, a lot of things they, they cannot see because everything is so fast now. Yeah. So I, I don't know. Yeah, it, it's a challenge uh, for parents. This is it a Christian school that they go to? Or? Uh, no, it's a government school. Government school, all right. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I mean, you know, people are just stupid, you know. I mean, saying these kind of things is just kind of st- stupid. And I think those, those kids who are Christian now and say this kind of thing, they may, en- they may end up as Buddhists down the track yeah, because <laughs> they realize that they were saying stupid things when they were younger. And I think the same thing with your kids. Instead of sending them to Sunday school, just uh, tell them that those kids don't know what they're talking about. They're just, se- they're just separating what their parents have told them. They have no idea what's going on. 
Yeah, and just teach them instead, instead of sending them to Buddhist school, uh, just teach them some common sense about these kind of things. Uh, obviously, it's just nonsense when people say that these kids don't know what they're talking about. Uh, you know, they're just children. Uh, and so t tell your kids to, okay, you know, just ignore stupid people because stupid people are not worthy listening to. Uh, that's what you should tell them probably, rather than send them to Sunday school. Uh. <laughs> that's my idea anyway. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, please. Ajahn, uh, I think, sister, you don't need to worry about sending them uh, to Sunday school because I think we have got this group of uh, uh, facilitators. Uh, sister May Liu, I think you've heard of her. Sister Mian, right? Uh, the Sunday school facilitators, I think inclusive of those from BGF, have attended a mindfulness session for teaching the children from the various uh, uh, ages, which we are going to introduce uh, starting this year. So we are making a shift from going towards, you know, Jataka stories and things like that, towards teaching the children mindfulness rather than going through that. So you don't have to worry about sending your children to Sunday school. We are making a shift towards all those things. <laughs> okay, excellent. So there's going to be like a Sunday school here, is that what you're saying? Yeah. But, but mindfulness Sunday school, not kind of Jataka Sunday school. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that's really cool. So there you are. There you have new options for the future. You're going to learn something real, not some dodgy, dodgy stuff. That's marvelous. Let's stop there uh, because it's getting already quarter past uh, four. Let's have half an hour break and then we come down for the last session on the Q&A at uh, quarter to five. Uh.